There we go. Okay, great. Uh, thank you all for coming to our, our first speaker this semester in our Bear Ranch Foundation seminar series. Uh, it's my privilege to introduce Dr. Samantha Brooks. Uh, she is currently an associate professor of equine physiology down at the University of Florida. Uh, prior to that, she was an assistant professor at Cornell University, and prior to that, she did her degrees at University of Kentucky. Um, she's a leader in the field of equine genetics and genomics, and she's going to talk a little bit about her research today, and we're privileged to have her. Awesome. Thank you. I, I am so glad to be here. So glad to be here. I'll, I'll tell you more about that. But yes, <laughs> um, I uh, so my my research program, you're going to learn more about as we go through the talk. It's pretty diverse, um, but I, I thought I would focus more on some of the phenotyping and physiology mm -hmm. side, given the expertise of the lovely folks here in uh, Montana. So I'll start off just by thanking some of our funding agencies, uh, because I, I always get to the end and I take too long and I forget to do this. Uh, there aren't enough of them here. That's a big problem we have in equine research right now is uh, we need to get industry a little bit more motivated, a little bit more organized to support science. That's my stump speech for the day. Um, but thank you to our funders um, and to my students over the years. That's two of my graduated PhD students and two of my graduated master's students because every once in a while we've had enough of science. We just have to go ride horses. Uh, so I am super glad to be here today. Um, I It was an interesting journey. I, uh, well, when I left Gainesville, it was beautiful, 80 degrees and sunny, and I thought this will be fantastic. Um, interestingly enough, I, I ended up not here at 11 o'clock last night, but in New Jersey, because of course, to go west, you fly east. Um, so Atlanta had a, a bit of a, a bit of a mix up. But so the reason I have this slide though, is I have to thank the one person who made this talk possible today. Um, her name is Heather. She works the night shift in the commuter um, the, a terminal at Atlanta, and uh, she worked some magic and saved me from certain abandonment. So um, Heather, wherever you are, we, we thank you. So I made it here. I haven't frozen to death. It's good. And I'm excited to talk to you all. I love to collaborate all the time. I will be happy to come back. I'll be here for, I think, 23 hours approximately. <laughs> Um, but we'll do it in the summer next time. Okay. <laughs> All right. So we better talk about some science uh, before, before I get off track here. So I am in an animal science department and um, inevitably they ask me why we don't eat my research subjects. Um, and I have to talk to them about, well, okay, the horse is important. And here is a really big reason. Um, you know, before the nuclear bomb and the terrible politics that we have today, the horse was the original kingmaker. They've been shaping our civilization for thousands of years. They did start off as a food source, maybe about 10,000 years ago, but since then they have shifted and changed human civilizations in immeasurable ways. As a result, we have this lingering relationship with them that is pretty unique among domesticated animals. When you think about the level of communication that we have with them, um, I would argue it actually rivals our, we have a few famous sheepdogs that have more than a thousand nouns in their vocabulary. And I would argue if you count non-verbal cues, the horse's vocabulary sometimes rivals that. So they're fascinating scientific subjects from that standpoint. But what's almost as interesting <laughs> To me in particular is what happens when things go wrong, right? Um, so, and that's where most of our industry participants have the greatest level of concern and when everything's going right, they're fine. But what happens when, when, goes wrong, when it goes wrong? So I'll talk a little bit about how our genomic tools uh, enable us as scientists to be able to approach these problems in the real world. The other thing I talk about when I'm at home all the time is that, um, you know, so my friends in animal science argue with me about how the horse does not have a commodity. And, and that's, that's absolutely not true. Um, we don't measure in, in pounds of food or fiber. Uh, our commodity is green, it's greenbacks. And for the state of Florida, the AHC estimated that our economic impact was about $6.8 billion. And Florida is a pretty big equine state, but there's, there's lots of big ones out there. 6.8 billion means nothing until I tell you that beef and dairy combined is about 1 billion. Nobody realizes that. Everybody thinks about the cow-calf operations. You know, it's a little hot for milk these days. But um, when you think about the amount of dollars invested in bovine research compared to horse research, compared to the economic impact, things quickly become out of balance. And, you know, you can't buy milk 
if you don't have a paycheck. So sometimes that total economic impact, we have to think about how it benefits a rural economy and helps to keep things going in terms of the greater agricultural ecosystem. The other cool thing is that within the state of Florida, they noted that about one in three households had at least one horse enthusiast. So while not everyone is uh, you know, at home with their own horse on their own acreage or managing a large breeding farm, there are lots of people there who are interested, excited about it. And a lot of them are very passionate. We call it passionate. Um, <laughs> and that means we have a large audience if we're just willing to network with them and communicate to them. Um, I will note that nationally, the total economic impact is typically estimated at about $122 billion, which rivals out of the motion picture industry, at least the industry is, as of 10 years ago before Netflix and all that's kind of kind of squeezing them out of business, but that's okay. All right, so it, when it comes to genomics, it all starts with this rock star right here. Her name is Twilight. Um, she has helped us to build some state-of-the-art genomic tools. Uh, she is the horse who was used for the first and best uh, genome assembly that we have. That is, that is actually really key. Um, until we had some of these newer sequencing technologies, if you didn't have a reference genome, you would not have a genomics program because you would not be able to write a competitive grant when you didn't have the tools that you need. Um, but we are very, very lucky when it comes to the horse that we actually have a suite of tools that easily rivals what's available for bovines or for dogs um, or sometimes for mice. Not as big as what they have for mice and humans, but, but we've got some fun toys. The other cool thing about the genome is it doesn't just benefit the geneticists. So having the genome also enables other types of tools. Things like custom antibodies can be designed from your computer with half a dozen clicks of a mouse. Because if you have a protein that you're interested in, you can go and find the horse predicted sequence, pull it down, find the peptide you want, send them off to a company and get what you need, at least an attempt at it. Um, that wasn't possible prior to the genome. You can also do things like proteomics where you catalog all the proteins that might be in a sample based on the reference list of proteins from the genome. Of course, I do like gene expression and that's, that is definitely a possibility. It helps us better understand the processes inside of a cell during things like disease. Um, and then there's a whole fun world now of nutrigenomics, which has uh, legitimate uses and a lot of buzz going on around it too, um, but is highlights, I think, one of the applications that is least appreciated, which is the use of genomics and precision management. So horses are long lived animals, and the better we can learn to avoid trouble, uh, the more sustainable uh, economically our operations are going to be. And of course, there is a possibility of selective breeding, but I don't think it's ever going to take the shape of what you see done with like the Angus Association or with Holsteins. This is going to have a different flavor, uh, a different art to it, and is still, I think, because of the structure of the industry going to be driven by the individual breeder, um, hopefully with some guidance from breed associations and some science, but you never know. All right, so um, what I tell people all the time is that genomics is not just for people who want to breed their horse. It is becoming more and more important in clinical diagnostics and in the realm of what I do like to call uh, precision management. If you know more about your horse, knowledge is power, and hopefully you can avoid trouble in the future, even for mature and aging animals. Okay, so you don't get to just sit on your hands today. I have a quiz, all right? So by a show of hands, can you guess how many genetic tests do we have for, for traits that are valued in the horse? Just a guess. How about show of hands for A? Yeah, students are in my class. They say, they say, never guess A. Brooks gets bored with A. She just goes right on. Okay, who thinks it might be 10 to 100 traits in the horse? There we go. Thanks for the hand. Okay, good. Who thinks it might be 100 to 1,000? Yeah, there we go. You guys do a lot of multiple choice around here. Okay, who thinks it's more, who thinks it's more than 1,000? There you go, a couple of you. Um, you know, I, I think the best answer here is C. I do like letter C, right? It's the <laughs> indecisive answer. You know, you kind of got to hedge your bets. Um, things that are mapped that have useful genetic markers are somewhere between 100 and 1,000. I used to give a number on every slide, and I had to update it every other week, and I got tired of that. So now I just give you this broad range. Um, the difference is there's only about a dozen that are actually in common use in the industry. 
The problem there is it would be nice to have more funding for validation, but more importantly, it's a breakdown in translation. So anyone in here who wants to go into extension, please learn genetics because I need your help desperately. Um, if I could clone myself, I could take care of all of the extension needs for the horse industry, but I can't, and I like to sleep every now and then. So please, some of you go into a career in, in extension. All right, let's move on to some actual science. That's my whole little spiel. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the things that we're doing in the realm of horse health, focusing on one of the top two uh, key health concerns for horses as defined by the AAEP. So uh, one of the reasons I love working in the horse is that they just have some really amazing physiology. And, and one of the things that we really value them for and have valued them for probably since the point of domestication is their physical ability as an athlete. You know, that's how they shifted human civilization was with a whole new realm of mobilization. And by and large, they are a masterful piece of, of biological engineering when they do that. So Dr. Clayton says that a horse moving at about 40 miles an hour, that front foot, when it whips through that gallop stride, is going to reach speeds of up to 100 miles an hour, which is pretty impressive on its own. But when you do some of the physics there, you're looking at a force of nearly uh, 4,500 pounds when it strikes the ground on an object that in a thoroughbred is about yay big. Uh, that's pretty impressive for, impressive for anything made of bone and blood and keratin, essentially. As a result, there is a whole multitude of things that can go wrong. And as much as uh, the realm of veterinary medicine has certainly advanced, especially when you think about even 50 years ago, we still are left somewhat, somewhat lost at times trying to figure out um, you know, we get behind the eight ball. We might be trying to treat things symptomatically, but actually understanding the underlying uh, pathways, creating issues with the limb of the horse uh, is still very challenging, much less identifying sometimes which limb it is and which joint and where and things like that. Unfortunately, because we value them so much for their mobility, the cost of lameness can be pretty high. So in a, an aged survey now from the USDA, I wish we could get some of these things redone, but um, it's hard to get things done these days. Um, about half of all facilities have at least one lame horse in any given time. So for anyone who's managing animals, this is something that occupies some part of your day at some point in time. And of those lamenesses at that time, they estimated that almost 20% of those involve some form of lamenitis. Um, and the AAEP, when they pull their membership for the top research priorities, laminitis is usually in there. Uh, at the time I wrote this slide, it was the second. I think it has slid a little bit in the one they just did last year. Um, but it's often right up there on the, the, among the conditions that give them the most concern, both in terms of uh, ethical treatment of animals, as well as in their own frustration with their inability to do anything reasonable about it. So when it comes to laminitis, again, from that same age survey from the USDA, what causes it is a bit of a mixed bag. We have almost half of it being attributed to lush pasture, which is a pretty vague sort of situational kind of thing that might include things like a sort of a toxic colitis sort of situation to chronic obesity in a horse who's always on lush pasture. And almost a third of those cases are pretty much unknown. Maybe 12% have some um, acute episode that we really can attribute to um, triggering that uh, laminitic situation. When I teach my horse health class, this is the slide that I use. And I say, well, we have three kinds of laminitis. So it's, we really have a variety of causes of laminitis, but we roughly categorize them into these three groups. So your catastrophic colics, uh, we tend to group those into toxic along with our uh, models, things like black walnut extract to trigger laminitis. Um, you have the, the catastrophic kind of mechanical founder, which we used to call road founder, but was um, more recently recognized in the case of uh, Barbaro, who uh, broke his leg on the track, but ultimately died several months later after all of the heroic efforts that all the great surgeons at New Bolton put into putting his leg back together, they could not do anything when the opposite limb fell apart due to laminitis. 
Um, so we have mechanical, which can do, be from wear, excessive wear and tear, but also from uneven limb loading. And then the vast majority of cases actually are attributable to what we call metabolic syndrome, which is this nebulous kind of condition. We do have some consensus statements on metabolic syndrome, and actually there's a fresh one now that I should add to my list of years here that um, gives us an idea. So a syndrome is a collection of clinical signs, right? And when it comes to horses, you know, 50 or 100 or 1,000 years ago, having a hardy metabolism was no doubt a benefit, especially when maybe going through things like a Montana winter where forage might be sparse. But these days, our nutritionists have done such a fantastic job creating these lovely balanced diets that are easy to purchase at the feed store that now we struggle far more with obesity than we do with starvation. So more often we're beginning to see these horses with this collection of signs. Uh, the name metabolic syndrome actually was borrowed from a human condition of similar name, and it has many of the same types of characteristics. Um, so things like obesity, insulin resistance, having high blood lipids, which we don't often measure in the horse, but it's there, other hormones like elevated leptin. And then in the horse, it's also characterized by high blood pressure, but we don't often measure blood pressure in horses, but it's an interesting characteristic when we think of them as a physiological model. In humans, uh, those with metabolic syndrome, uh, the, the primary secondary complications of concern would be uh, diabetes, and then the risk for heart disease and stroke. In horses, what gives out is typically their hooves and not their, their brains and their hearts. So they develop laminitis due to um, who knows what? We don't fully understand it. Um, hopefully we'll figure that out soon. So given the scope of this problem, when we thought we would take a new look at laminitis, um, I decided to pull out all the stops and go with a new uh, route to try to describe this. Because when I talk to veterinarians and talk about a horse and say metabolic syndrome or not, I'll get six different answers from six different veterinarians. And uh, that doesn't help me. I'm a geneticist. I like things to be measurable, to be quantitative. I love it when they're normally distributed, but um, I certainly can't do the, the circular head nodding thing that, that won't map well. So we have a new, a new core facility at the University of Florida focused on metabolomics. Uh, metabolomics just describes a high throughput analytical chemistry field of study where you use techniques like NMR or in our case, mass spec to quantify all the small molecules in a biological sample. In our situation, we utilized blood. Then you, what you get is a bunch of molecular weights for fragments of chemistry that was in that original sample. Some of those, we know what they are. Many of them, we do not know what they are. So they become variables that get tossed into a model. Um, those models can include clustering methods like you see here on the bottom left, um, as well as some other things. And when you have identifications, you can then take these clouds of variables and put them into things like pathway analysis, which starts to give you the biological interpretation that we as humans so desperately want to hear. And then we'll just go with this one day. So, so where does all the, all the small molecules come from? Well, when I say metabolomics, most people say, oh, it's from your metabolism, right? Yes, some of it does come from the horse or human. And as a result of the breakdown and, and construction of various molecules within your cells, uh, but it also comes from other places. In human diabetes, one of our collaborators on this project actually had a very interesting study where they pointed out that some of the key biomarkers were not derived from the humans, but from their gut microbiome and were being catalyzed by enzymes in the microbes, not by the human. So the microbes might be contributing to those chemicals that you measure in the blood. Of course, there's consumable items, things like feed. Uh, you can detect that in the uh, metabolites. Um, that can include purposefully fed items as well as not purposefully fed items. And if you happen to, happen to be the Queen of England, sometimes that includes the poppies you claim your racehorse grazed on out of a bale of hay. Um, may or may not be true. Uh, that also can include things like pharmaceuticals that are given therapeutically or illicitly or otherwise, and uh, environmental exposures. So sometimes anything that can be absorbed by the skin, we can pick up in those metabolites. What we end up with is um, quite a forest of trees from which we have to make a um, somewhat coherent story. 
So we launched into this um, with some pilot funding from the new core facility UF, and uh, we started visiting farms. We went to visit the farms because the sensitivity of this assay means you have to handle that sample very carefully. So we actually took a liquid nitrogen tank with us to the farm, drew the blood. I had a centrifuge that fit in the back of my pickup and you know, have nitrogen will travel. We went all over the place, drove the truck right out in the field, drew the blood, spun it in place. And as soon as we could get it separated and frozen, it was frozen. That's somewhat impractical sometimes, but um, for our first look, we wanted to be as careful as possible. We focused on the Arabian breed primarily because I had a couple big projects funded by Arabian interest groups. And so I could leverage some of the genomics resources I was developing there. And as it happens, they're pretty hardy critters that do not infrequently have metabolic syndrome and have contributed to a lot of our, our other light horse breeds. So genes that they might have for predisposition aren't unlikely to be found in other groups. We wanted to look primarily at aged animals so that if they were susceptible, we could hedge our bets that they were exposed to the environmental variables that will trigger disease. Uh, we tried to avoid things like pregnancy or stallion status. And um, with much debate, we finally settled on the idea that we were just going to do our insulin and glucose measures after a light fasting. So they, we held off hard feed, but these horses were allowed to eat forages. Uh, we weren't going to try to do any sort of clamp. We weren't going to be feeding these horses caro syrup. Um, it was impractical, a little expensive, and my collaborating clinicians really felt it would be overkill to do that. And y'all can argue with me about it later. But um, this is the way we, we went and it went all right, I think. We also targeted an unusual time of year and that we tried to hit the fall peak in uh, the hormone ACTH that's commonly used as a, one of the diagnostic parameters for Cushing's disease. Uh, we were hoping that would draw out our, our horses that actually had Cushing's. Um, that may or may not have worked. <laughs> it was a challenge because we wanted to exclude animals that had Cushing's because it sometimes has overlapping clinical signs. What we discovered very quickly is that we could not go out and target horses who had severe laminitis because at that point, um, well, things had gotten out of hand. And it was a bit like trying to study arson from a house that's already a pile of ashes. And when we're thinking about our metabolites, these animals were also getting all sorts of pharmaceuticals and interventions that made it really, really hard to sift out the chemicals that we needed to get. So if we wanted to look at things, the best point in time to study, truthfully, is when that arsonist strikes that match. And although we didn't really know when that was going to happen, we looked at a broad population of animals and then kind of let, um, let the, the variables fall where they would. We didn't try to categorize these horses a priori into reference ranges or clinical bins. That meant we had to look a lot of horses. And if I could have had 5,000 horses, I would have, but what we started with ended up being 50 because that was what was funded by our pilot grant. The interesting thing was, and it, when we categorized the initial 74 cases, we only had 50 horses funded for the metabolomics. When we looked at their biological parameters, they actually clustered themselves fairly well into groups that sort of started to look, we can't call it EMS because our, our veterinary reviewers on our paper said, well, you didn't do the gold standard diagnostics. I'm like, well, that was my point. But those that look like they had EMS clustered the, together. Um, when we, we, used a, we used a summary statistic here called a principal components analysis that took all those nine variables and just collapsed them into easy scores. The other, uh, source of variation tended to be the horses who looked like they actually had PPID, which confounded me to no end because I'm like, we tried to get rid of all those PPID horses. Uh, truthfully, we found horses who had ACTHs over a thousand, uh, I forget what the units is on that, um, and had no overt clinical signs. And our, took, I took a practicing veterinarian with me everywhere we went, board certified um, in medicine, and they looked at every animal and they said, Psh, I never would have guessed. So we need to rethink this whole Cushing situation. We'll do that later. But um, this gave me a nice EMS score that I like as a geneticist. It's quantitative, it's normally distributed, and it probably catches some of those horses that are early in disease rather than those who are, are late. And if you're interested in learning more about our statistical approach here, you can read the full paper in PLOS one. So when we got to the metabolites, 
Finally, sorry, it's been a long road to this one. We started with our, our 50 odd horses. One horse killed their machine is basically what happened. Um, we worked with blood plasma, which they tell me is horrific for mass spec because in horses it's very heavy in protein. We uh, pulled from that nearly 7,000 uh, mass features, 7,000 different chemicals. That's a huge library only about half of which uh, passed our stringent quality filters and far less than that were actually identified, though I gave up on trying to know what they were. When we correlated those just by a linear model, bless you, to our EMS score, we ended up with a, um, a whole bunch of linear regressions. And uh, being a geneticist, we are very familiar with the sin of multiple testing. So we went with the most cruel correction uh, and uh, did a Bonferroni. After Bonferroni, four of these we called very um, uh, strongly correlated and we went with those. I've got 3000 more we could look at later, but I don't have time. So we went with the top four. And here's just one of them just kind of showing you how well these things uh, correlate to our EMS score. Just for funsies, we did uh, do some hierarchical clustering. So the colors on the bars correlate to the clusters that you saw with our two summary variables. And these are the four metabolites in blood. And you can kind of see that our EMS, we have to still call them EMS suspect horses, uh, fell over here where most of those four variables are blue. Uh, some of those horses didn't get categorized that way by their physiological measures, but did look that way from their blood. And uh, some of these animals, we actually tried to follow up on them about five years ago, and about half of them were unfindable or dead. So I was hoping I could do longitudinal studies and show that some of those horses actually later developed metabolic syndrome or laminitis, and it proved to be really hard. Studying old horses is tough. Um, so now I've done all this chemistry. I want to get back to the biology. What does it mean? Well, I am after all a geneticist. So at the end of the day, if you ask me how to do this, I say, oh, I'll just do it with the genes. Um, so, you know, some of those are due to the host or due to the horse, and we can track them in the host genetics. But remember, I told you some of them are going to come from other environmental components. Um, we actually found that a lot of our horses were old and they were getting adequan and I could find adequan in their mass spec results. A lot of them might be getting, we tried to um, uh, not have horses on butte. We excluded other drugs because they suggested other diseases, but they could still be there. When we look, so what we did is we used the heritability estimates to try to figure out what are going to be the most likely targets. Um, and I have the top 10 here just because it made a pretty picture. As it turns out, these guys pretty much clustered in nearly Mendelian heritability levels or not at all um, genetic. So uh, from there, we started to target the ones that had higher heritabilities. It, it makes some sense that those that are uh, uh, under the control of host, of host pathways would be nearly Mendelian because each of these chemical reactions is often coming down to a single enzyme and a single pathway because we're measuring every single chemical step. This makes it a whole lot easier for me as a geneticist. I don't have to try to build a linear model with five or six or 10 or 50 different covariates because I have now subtracted everything down into individual pathways. I can throw covariates in there if I want to overfit my model, but the fancy phenotyping, I think, cleared a lot of that out. So uh, we did not intend to do this GWAS. Those 50 horses were pilot data that went into, I won't tell you how many grants um, that did not get funded. Um, I had several agencies tell me that we don't need to study laminitis anymore. Somebody's already cure, uh, cured that. Um, I was like, well, funny thing. I, I seem to hear it's still a problem, right? Um, but I had a student, she didn't graduate. And after three years, I was like, fine, run the GWAS. Let's see what happens. And this is what happened. Uh, right away, we got one significant hit for two of the top four metabolites, which probably are paired somewhere in that pathway. So um, this is a Manhattan plot laying out the genome from chromosome one all the way to our sex chromosomes on the right. And the, each point is the, is the minus log 10 of the p value. So um, Happy places are above the Bonferroni threshold, which looks like we have just one lonely point. But when we zoom in, it turns out we basically pegged the meter for a region defined by 10 different SNPs. That is flat top because I have squeezed every ounce of statistical significance I could out of my measly 49 horses. 
Um, anybody in here who does any kind of genetics and any bovine is now chuckling if they aren't rolling around on the floor because they'll tell you you can't do a GWAS on anything less than 400 animals. And humans, they'll say 4,000 is what you need. I was desperate. We had to do something. Um, and in this case, our excellent phenotyping is probably what saved us in many ways. Cool thing is, is when we went back to the biology, all of a sudden things are starting to come together. So in that red region of, of genes there, we found two key candidate genes for uh, diabetes in humans. Um, but also on the left and right of that, we have two genes called adiponectin and somatostatin. And if anybody ever looks at feed efficiency and things like that in bovines, they'll know that those two are key regulators for metabolism. Right, so we sort of came up cherries on this one. I don't think I could could find a better region of the genome for us to land on. Pro, my guess is that there's something regulatory going on here. Adiponectin specifically was previously suggested by a group in the United Kingdom as a biomarker for laminitis um, in a prospective study, uh, but they considered it to be a measurement of environmental risk factors. They didn't consider the hypothesis that those horses had altered adiponectin levels because of a heritable susceptibility. But if I had to put my money on something, that's where I would put it. And someday, if we ever get a grant funded, we're gonna follow that up. Um, if you wanna read more about that, you can see our, our published paper from a couple years ago. <laughs> Speak of the devil, that's my PhD student who wrote that paper calling me. Her ears must be burning. <laughs> All right, so um, I'm gonna move from there into some of our more fun and forward looking projects. Instead of talking about sick horses so much, we're gonna talk about some other things. So whether you're working with horses or with bovines or sometimes even small animals, one of the key characteristics of domesticates is that they do have to alter their behavior. To become part of our agricultural ecosystem, they have to learn to work across species in ways that generally don't come naturally to them. And we do think that in that great, that cluster of physiological changes we call domestication syndrome, that the acquisition of more juvenile physiological traits is pretty common across our domesticated mammals, but also some more juvenile behavioral traits. In studies of wild animals, uh, when they look at selective pressure, um, there are several good studies that show that um, when it comes to overall fitness, overall survival in a given uh, ecosystem, that the behavioral traits will often trump all the other physiological adaptations. And if you think about it, you go to the bar on Friday night, you can see this in action, right? It doesn't always matter if you're the biggest and the strongest, if you don't have the will to throw the punch, right? This turns out to be true for, for animals as well, is it doesn't always matter if you're faster than the gazelle next to you, if you freeze and forget to run in the side of a lion, you're gonna have a problem. So um, I've become sort of fascinated with some of our behavioral uh, traits. Um, in particular, just to tell you a little bit about Florida, we do have primarily cow-calf operations and there are places in Florida where working animals with horses is still the best way that you can get there. Four wheelers and aren't always um, fantastic in some of the, the terrain that we have, um, and they do still rely on horses. But in general, if I think more about the bovine side of behavior, and I'll explain to you in a minute why I think horses are the large animal to go with as a model here, um, our operations in Florida typically lose between one and 3% of all calves to predation. And uh, there's no shortage of things that want to eat you in Florida. Um, the Panther in particular, we really have to protect. And that creates conflict with a lot of our ranchers who are losing calves in many cases to the panther, partially because the panther has lost many of its natural food sources. But also coyotes, uh, we do have a, some uh, significant black bear populations. They had a pretty large cull this year and the occasional alligator gets his meal as well. And the snakes do their fair share too. In fact, we've had more trouble on our local farm at UF with young horses and snakes than we have had with alligators. <clears throat> so on the animal side, um, while you know having that um, more wild type instinct to, to uh, startle at the sight of a threat like a predator should be adaptive from a natural selection standpoint. And as a rancher, you might want the more wary cow because maybe she's gonna keep her calf safer. On the flip side of that though, 
we still have to work with these animals. So it's hard to find numbers on this, but the one study that seemed most relevant was done in Colorado in about 2005, where they show that about one third of horse related activities all came from ranch hands in the state of Colorado. Um, and anybody, you know, we can count the number of broken bones and things that we've had from working with horses and large animals. But that study only considered the horse side of things. It's true also for the bovines. And when you talk to a few of these ranchers in Florida, you know, they really, they really like the cows that are easier to work with because they keep their weight on better. They raise their calves well, and there's less overall stress due to handling. So you get this real balance where you want something that can keep itself alive, um, but also be tractable and handleable. And the horses, you want them to be quick, but you don't want them to kill you. Um, so understanding these behavioral phenotypes, I think, is underestimated as a, a valuable tool in large animal management across the board. The neat thing about horses is we have a nice program there at UF where I have an army of undergraduate students who uh, work with a dedicated set of about 20 young horses every born every year. Um, and I can ask them to do things would be very difficult to do with beef. When I talk to our beef guys, they kind of chuckle like you want to do what? Um, but the truth of it is, once again, we need a better measure of these behaviors. Things like shoot scores have pretty measly heritabilities because there's too many environmental variables. And I can make however many covariates I want. All it's going to do is muddle my model. So I'd rather have a better phenotype than a better measure. So we're breaking this behavior down to the part that probably is the most heritable because it is subconscious and in other species has the lowest impact due to things like life experience and learning, and that's the startle reflex. And this is the point in my talk where I always wish I could pull out an air horn and let you all experience the startle reflex, but I will spare you. Um, it is, it can be invoked by auditory or visual or uh, other stimuli and is that immediate reaction that is, again, completely subconscious. Um, of course, what happens later is a little, a little different. So we, we train these horses. These are one of our typical round pens and we put some equipment on them. He's wearing a heart rate monitor, which helps us get to that subconscious level because this happens within seconds of the stimulus. We do monitor their gross behaviors with a camera and our favorite stimulus is a, uh, a little umbrella that opens automatically and predictably does generally elicit this, the um, behavior we want from, from horses. So we teach these guys to come into this pen. I've got some chalk markings there to help us measure. And they're accustomed to entering and finding a snack, which most horses won't pass up. It goes something like this. I always feel a little guilty. <laughs> right? You guys kind of knew that was gonna happen. Yeah, kind of knew it's gonna happen. What's really, really fun, especially now that we've done this on coming up on 120 young horses and we do them as weanlings and we do them as two-year-olds just for the sale is that we are really picking up the full spectrum of this phenotype. Um, so this horse has become rather famous. After we sold him as a three-year-old, <laughs> As a three-year-old, he took his young rider to the state 4-H show uh, in Tampa at the huge fairgrounds and never batted an eye. Um, so he's one of our record holders. One of his compatriots from the very same year behaved this way, <laughs> right? And never again will approach that pan and don't go visit him on a rainy day because he is to this day traumatized by umbrellas, right? We do a desensitization before we sell these horses because I don't want to create liability there. Um, I know, poor feller, poor feller. Um, some of this, you know, the, we've looked at things like wind, barometric pressure is trending towards significance now, towards influencing. We study uh, how well they do on their, on their weanling handling test. We study the level of experience of the humans. Someday we're gonna actually monitor the human's heart rate while they're working with the horse because I really wanna see how that's working out. Um, but to start with, we're, we're going very, very basic. So if we think about that subconscious startle reflex, the thing that we call spook, here's your last quiz of the day. How much of that do you think is due to genetics? I've been harping on about how it's gotta have lots of genes, right? But how many, how many? Show of hands, who thinks this is not at all genetic, this has to do with the direction the wind is blowing? All right, smart, I'm the geneticist. I might have to kick you out if you said zero. <laughs> Definitely get an F for the day. Okay, it's not zero. 
Okay, show of hands, who thinks it's 20% heritability price, approximately, okay? Who thinks it's 60%? There we go. Who thinks it's 100% congenital from birth? Okay, you guys are, you guys are good there too. As it turns out, our preliminary data says that what happens in the first three seconds since startle is two thirds due to genes. Two thirds, that's huge. Though anybody who's been dumped on their ass in the last year or so is thinking, man, two thirds of that is heritable out of my control. What's really cool is when we look at the video data and we start to categorize those later behaviors based on an ethogram, what happens after those three seconds, the heritability drops off sharply, sharply. And that's where we have a chance to intervene. So if the horse feels that initial fear or not, that's strongly genetic. But what they do with that, that's a conscious choice. And that's where trainers have the opportunity to intervene. And wouldn't you love to know when that foal hits the ground, is this one gonna be the deadhead? I should mark it towards the 4 h -er? Or is that one gonna be the quick one I better send to the barrel racer? Especially the barrel racer with a good reputation because it's gonna be a firecracker, right? Genes hopefully will give us the, the chance to, um, to do that. Right, so Barclay presented that data now two years ago in uh, PAG, and she's working on mapping those traits uh, slowly but surely. The other cool thing about having our group of horses there at UF is that um, we get to do lots of stuff. So since we have a genomic study, we are categorizing lots of traits. And Alex knows all about the joys of this study, right? Um, so our undergrads undertake measuring of these animals for a variety of things. And for more than a decade now, we've had this a standardized protocol of 35 body measures. We've measured about 2000 horses with this protocol. And we started with a citizen science approach that Chris actually worked on as Dr. Posberg, worked on as an <laughs> undergraduate too, where he gathered over 400 samples of horses measured by 4-Hers. So um, it's something that we had to keep simple enough that we could send it out. Um, the exciting thing is, is we're starting to pick apart some traits within our UF uh, quarter horses on this one. So um, when it comes down to, again, we used a summary statistic because I like to do that. I just throw everything in there in the mix and see where our variability comes out. In our UF quarter horses, we do come up with two body types. One's our taller, leggier hunter type of horse. And on the opposite end of that spectrum, we get the smaller, branchier kind of animal. And we can now assign a score to that. That's a little bit more accurate for total body proportion than just withers height would be. If we look at the second uh, underlying sort of hidden variable that captures um, some of that diversity in body type, we find that um, if I control, so I'm gonna scale all these horses for you for the same body size, we start to see a little bit different type. And these horses tend to be hip high for sure, but where we really see strong differences is actually in there face. We, our, our body measures protocol is a little bit heavy on the face. There's seven measures there. So we do tend to pick up more variation in the face. But the thing is, we as humans, we really like faces. So a good head on a horse will often really changes market value. So that's how I justify it. But um, so if I look at a pair of horses, here's one horse from the front and from the side that have the same body scale, but very distinct uh, scores on that factor two, you can see that this a little chest out here, he's got a much smaller, daintier head um, than, the, than his compatriot. And again, because we're using multiple measures, the error terms within each of those individual measures and the downsides to having all, uh, hundreds of observers taking these measures start to fall out in the mix. And we're getting to break it down into some fairly simple genetic traits. So uh, Barclay has two significant genomic loci creating that difference in head shape. Um, so we're going to start to pick apart the biology of that just a little bit. You think about who's going to want to genetic test their horse for whether she makes a pretty head or not. I don't know. The hip high thing kind of interests me though, because one of the challenges we have in our core horses that's related to growth is we end up with a fair number of OCDs. So I'm really curious as to how these are changing proportions and that growth curve, uh, because that might really help us uh, to tackle the difficult things like um, osteochondrosis. 
Frankly, also last week showed me some really cool data about that overall body scale stuff, which if you give me a beer, I'll tell you about later. Um, but for now, it's too new. I'm not going to talk about it. But Barclay presented this in January at, a, at another meeting, and she's supposed to be writing the manuscript while I'm here. We'll see if that's happening. Okay, last thing very quickly so that I leave some time for some questions. Now we're really, now that I have tenure, I'm like, ah, to hell with it. Let's just do the projects that are moonshots. So um, we're going for the phenotypes that are really, really tough, really hard to do. I'm a glutton for punishment. Kids who've worked with me will tell you I get bored easily. So um, let's think about uh, how our horses do what they do that actually brings home the dollars. And that's, that's how they move. So if we look at the state of the art, there's all sorts of interesting technology, things like force plates and accelerometers. Um, there's an interesting sort of saddle configuration going on there that looks like something I do not want to put on my two-year-old quarter horses, all of which tend to be pretty impractical and expensive. And um, uh, to date, I think the largest gait study, motion study in horses that is published, I believe my master student told me had 12 horses. Uh, and there was one in cattle and dairy cattle that had, I think, a uh, sample size of 60 or 70. And I really shouldn't attempt GWAS in samples that small. So um, we need something that can be done in a large number of animals. And it has to be cheap because I hate writing grants and money is hard to get. So things like nine camera arrays that use reflectors are not going to work in the field. They're not going to work with young horses and I can't afford them and I can't do them on hundreds of animals, which is what I want to do. So we are once again back to the drawing board and we're rewriting things, starting with a tool that's called Deep Lab Cut. It uses an artificial intelligence approach to take frames of high resolution, high speed video and learn the shapes within those frames to automatically label them without a human having to examine every frame. So the study in dairy cattle that I mentioned that I have, I think 60 or 70 animals, a human sat there and labeled every single frame of video. Uh, Maddie has to date something like 40,000 frames of video. And she calculated at the rate that she can label a frame, it would take her something like seven months working full time to do those. And by the end of it, she would be bashing her head against the wall bored with trying to do that. The other cool thing about doing these behavioral phenotypes in the horse is that we have handling opportunities that are not gonna come in bovines. So most of our video has come from the standard veterinary inspections that are done in horse sport, because I can sit in one place and watch huh, 400 horses trot quietly in front of me all day long. So I get a press pass, I take my camera and I just sit there and click the button and watch them go past. And we have to date video on over 2000 horses. Um, that's a sample size that starts to mean something and doing the same thing in bovines of any kind will be pretty tough. Once we frame out this pipeline using our easy equines, then we can adapt the tool to bovines or other large animals to be able to do some of the kind of uh, field management kind of computational fancy computer vision things that you wanna do but I want to train my computer pipelines first on a reasonable sample size. The hard part comes with the thousands of cells worth of coordinate data that we get from those labels. So we're working now to develop some pipelines that do some standard gate parameters like stride length and speed and joint angles, but we're also planning on maybe doing some machine learning. So this is a plot just of each of our labels as it goes across the frame to see if we can pick up characteristic patterns in those. And then of course, someday I want to be a geneticist again and I'll wanna integrate this very deep, highly dimensional data set into the genomics of these animals to see if I can pick apart the things that might be heritable and relevant to health someday. So just to give you an idea of how this works, this uh, screenshot here, this is Maddie actually going through the labeling process. Um, so she'll do about 5% of the frames in her pilot study right now, which has, I think 400 videos in it. Um, so that, that number of frames is not unreasonable to do. It, it'll then take our computer uh, resources, which typically require a graphics processing unit, about three to four days to train the model so the computer can learn the shapes that she's showing it in the frame. And then we can label videos at a rate of 
oh, it takes us about 10 seconds per video to label them compared to seven months. So in about a week, she can do what would take a human about seven months. So here's just an example um, video. This is one of our sport horses going across the frame. We do label the human legs so that we can subtract them out. I, I can't quite get the handlers to just turn the horses loose. I don't know why. Um, so I subtract them out of the model uh, using again, the, the machine learning approach. So um, Maddie's preliminary data, well, it's not, you know, this go off to the inspections and gather video is a, an easy button for a large sample size, but it, it doesn't necessarily get at the questions I want to answer, but it does provide some natural experiments. One of which is in one of my favorite sports, which is uh, three-day eventing, because they require inspections before and after that hard endurance phase of cross country. So it gave Maddie a chance to uh, investigate some parameters of fatigue. So far, one of the most interesting ones that she has seen is speed. And when you talk to the, the handlers of these animals, that they're, they're trying to fool those veterinarians. They don't want that veterinarian to pull their horse out of competition at the end of the day. And they try to push these horses to go as fast as they can. And yet on average, we can tell that a post cross country horse compared to himself on day one, still goes a little bit slower. How much slower? About three inches per second slower on average. Human eye is not gonna pick up three inches per second, right? So it's giving me a depth and a level of detail that would be absolutely impossible by the gold standard clinically, which is um, the human eye. And of course we are already starting to take that back and across the farm. So this is an example of a, um, a modeled um, uh, bovine here. This is not my favorite video. The favorite video I have is actually of a little crossbred calf literally bucking across the screen, but um, my download speed in the airport wasn't great. I couldn't get the bucking calf. He's super cute. Um, in, in the bovine realm, we're more interested in looking at conformational traits so that you could assess conformation just basically as they go across the screen. But lameness is a serious issue too, particularly in the dairy. The cost of lameness is estimated about $52 million a year annually. So automatic identification of lame dairy cows might be a nice application. So just to wrap it up, because I always tend to go too long, um, we are interested in some of these technologies for the idea of genomic selection for health and performance once I start to pull out the genes, but we're hoping that these have some real applications for precision management and in the clinic. So, you know, when I get tired of reinventing the wheel, at the end of the day, I do hopefully get to do my genetic studies, but maybe we've made some things that'll be useful along the way. All right. I, that's all I brought, which is probably enough. Um, and if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Stunned silence. <laughs> yeah. When you were teaching the horses, did they just like keep one horse one time and then never feed in that same horse again because it might be yeah, excellent point. So we were really concerned about the possibility of desensitization. And some of our reviewers who do um, these things in mice and humans do absolutely ask that question on the grant. So one of the things we kind of monitored um, is in some of our first cohorts, we did kind of test it out a little bit and see would they still react weeks, months, um, and later on. And, and we could tell that just with a single exposure, there really wasn't as much desensitization as you might expect. And with our schedule of testing as a weanling, and then again, as a two-year-old, 18 months have passed. And uh, we, uh, the, the older horses tend to have a stronger fear response. Okay. That makes sense in terms of uh, neurological development. If you think about infants um, have less fear to things like falling or heights. It's as you mature, you tend to gain fear of all sorts of things. So our older horses are more fear, fearful and more fit in general. And we still see the scale of their response being greater than the younger horses. Um, so, you know, if we did it two days apart, uh, like some of our reviewers kind of suggested, I'm sure those horses by the third day would be done um, and not really care. But with uh, 18 months of time, we still get a very, very strong response. We also thought about switching the stimulus, but then we were worried that um, the change in stimulus to things like a trash bag full of cans, empty, empty food cans, would have a whole other scale of reaction to it as well. So it made sense to keep the same stimulus, but add some time. Good question. Oh, 
awesome. Sure. Um, in your metabolomic study, you identified you pointed out four yeah. uh, features mm -hmm. uh, of, that were strongly correlated to that metabolic syndrome. Mm -hmm. Were you able to identify any of those? Uh, we have putative identification for some of those. And I would love to have those uh, investigated further as potential diagnostic biomarkers. I think that's would be a fantastic application. One of the biomarkers from that key red region had two possible identifications, one of which got us a little worried at first because it was something called carbidopa. And carbidopa is in that sort of levodopa family. Think of um, the, that was a drug that's investigated for treating of um, Parkinson's. I hope I have that right. And carbidopa is found in things like soybeans and fava beans. And uh, when you think about feed ingredients, the idea that our horses are getting carbidopa from feed and that's giving them metabolic syndrome is a little concerning. Um, I think because of the strong heritability, it's not impossible that there's not some enzyme converting that. But my guess is the second possible identification, with the, which is something called porphoblinogen, which is important in the heme pathway and is often altered in liver disease and has been shown to be different in some particular types of insulin dysregulation in humans. Um, so that would be something that's more intrinsic to the horse. So that's my guess of the two, but we really need additional funding to pick those apart. Um, it's actually not terribly expensive to get our core to identify something. Uh, they just have to do some additional analytical chemistry to figure it out. And I haven't found the money yet to pay them to do it. Someday. I'll buy more lottery tickets. Some of the others are sort of moderately interesting. You can pull them up in the paper if you want, but that, that's the one that pricked our ears. Awesome. All right, well, later on, um, after a couple beers, when you think of all sorts of fascinating questions, let me know and I will be happy to answer them. Thanks. Uh, graduate students uh, in all range sciences and lunch should be down the hall for you.